everybody. So today we will talk more about the urinary system. You know, uh, filtration occurs in the kidney. Kidneys produce urine by filtration, right? So we'll see how filtration occurs. We'll talk about the filtration pressure and filtration rate. Then we'll talk about the renin angiotensin system. Renin angiotensin system is responsible for regulating the blood pressure. So blood pressure regulation is the function of this system. Then we'll talk about the tubular reabsorption and secretion, countercurrent mechanism of formation of urine. What is that? Then we'll talk about the mechanism of dilute and concentrated urine production. You remember in last class I mentioned that a couple of hormones work on the nephron. And those hormones are important to produce dilute and concentrated urine. Then we'll talk about the urinary bladder and urine tract. And the hormones work on the kidneys. So, three processes of urine formation, filtration, reabsorption, secretion. I explained these three processes in last class, but just quickly reviewing it. This is the Bowman's capsule, proximal convoluted tubule, then the loop of Henle, then the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. Okay? So this is a nephron. And you also remember that afferent arterial forms a tuft of capillary or ball of capillary that is called the glomerulus and then efferent artery. So this is afferent arterial, this is efferent arterial and this is the glomerulus. Okay? The capillary ball or tuft of capillary. <coughs> now, when the blood circulates inside this glomerulus for a long time, because it is very long, what happens, the fluid is pushed from the blood to the nephron. And that is called what? Filtration. Okay, make sense? So by filtration, fluid moves from the blood to the nephron. Is it clear? Now, to move the fluid from here to here, just think simple. The pressure should be more where? In the capillary or in the nephron? To push in the capillary, right? From here to here. To move the fluid, you need more pressure here, high pressure here, and low pressure here. That makes sense, right? So that pressure difference will push the fluid out. Is it clear? The pressure difference will do what? Push the fluid out from the blood. Is it clear? Okay. So we'll see what's the amount of that pressure. That pressure is in normal condition 10 millimeter of mercury. That is the pressure that pushes the fluid from the glomerulus to the nephron. That causes filtration. How much pressure? 10 millimeter of mercury. Now, there are three pressures work here in this part. Those three pressures are here, you see. 
look at this. Two pressures are trying to keep the fluid inside the blood vessels, inside the capillary. Two pressures. And one pressure is trying to push it out. So one pressure is, look at me, one pressure is trying to push the fluid out from the blood and two pressures are opposite it. Now if I add those two pressures together, those pressures are opposite and that pressure is favoring, which one should be more to cause filtration? The favoring pressure should be more, right? So if I add those two, those two are together how much <coughs> less? 10 millimeter of mercury less than the favoring pressure. Is it clear? So that's the net filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure is 10 millimeter of mercury that is causing the filtration. Now, <coughs> the pressure that is favoring the filtration that is called glomerular hydrostatic pressure and the amount is 55 millimeter mercury. Glomerular hydrostatic pressure, 55 millimeter of mercury. And two opposing pressures are blood colloidal osmotic pressure, which is 30 millimeter of mercury, and capsular hydrostatic pressure, which is 15 millimeter of mercury. So, this way, the pressure is 55 millimeter of mercury and opposing pressures are 30 plus 15, these two, that means 45 millimeter of mercury, opposing pressure. The difference between 55 and 45 is 10 millimeter of mercury, that is causing the filtration, okay? Now, in two kidneys, each kidney has about one million nephrons. You already know that, right? So in two kidneys, together, you have how many nephrons? Two million, okay? Although all of them are not working, uh, but just know that two kidneys together, that means all those nephrons, million nephrons together, producing 120 to 125 millimeter filtration amount of fluid entering here from the blood in one minute in two kidneys together 120 to 125 milliliter in one minute and that is the glomerular filtration age in one minute how much fluid is entering into the nephrons all together. <clears throat> now, one more thing you need to know here, like if in all the nephrons together in one minute, here 125 milliliter fluid enters here, that's the glomerular filtration rate, and when the fluid passes through the tube, nephrons, you have seen in last class, how much is reabsorbed here? Anybody remember? 65%. Remember that? So 65% of this will be taken back into the body only in this part, when the fluid will pass through this very early part of the nephron. Like so. Then a lot of water gets out here, reabsorption of water, right? Sodium, Chloride, potassium gets out here. One hormone works here that is called the aldosterone that takes a lot of water out from here. Antidiuretic hormone, a lot of here uh, water gets out because of the presence of antidiuretic hormone. So you see, reabsorption of fluid and water is occurring almost everywhere. So when the fluid gets out from the collecting duct here. Only how much remains here? One percent. So one percent 
of filter becomes filtered, 1% of filter becomes urine. 99% is taken back into the body. 65% here and the rest, you know, uh, how much? 34% is reabsorbed in different parts. Okay? So only 1% gets out as urine. Now, if the filter, uh, uh, the volume is 125 here, only 1.25 milliliter urine is formed. Okay? That means only 1% of that filter. <clears throat> we talked about this in last class. So, filtration occurs here, reabsorption occurs everywhere. Some places water, some places solutes, some places both. And another thing happens during urine formation that is called secretion. For example, hydrogen ion. If hydrogen ion concentration increases in your blood, your blood will be acidic, will move towards acidic. In that case, directly hydrogen ion will enter into the nephron from the body to get out with the tube. So that is called secretion. Secretion. Just opposite of reabsorption. Okay? <coughs> Three processes of urine formation. Renin angiotensin system. of a nephron, we make the nephron, you know, uh, wide, so you can see different parts. But think that one million nephrons are inside the kidney, this size, right? One million is inside the kidney. So everything is actually what? Squeezed heavily, right? Not like spread that big. This is just for the picture, for you to understand. So what happens actually inside the kidney is proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, okay, distal convoluted tubule, uh, goes like this, another one, this is another nephron, proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, everything is very squeezed, okay? and then distal convoluted tubule here, okay, and collecting duct. So now, if I draw this way, actually inside the kidney, this is the afferent arterial, glomerulus, afferent artery. So what happens here, you see, inside the kidney, these two parts, this is the beginning of distal convoluted tubule, end of ascending limb, this part, and the afferent arterial. These two structures come close inside the kidney. Okay? So, these two structures together form the juxtra glomerular apparatus. Juxtra glomerular apparatus or JGA. That means the late part of ascending limb and beginning of distal convoluted tubule and the afferent artery. Okay? That's the juxta glomerular apparatus. And why this structure is very important? Because if you see the wall of the afferent arterial here, in the wall of the afferent arterial, only in this part, you have very important cells in the wall. These cells are called the granular cells. 
Okay, so in the wall of the afferent arteriole, you have the granular cells. And these granular cells secrete a very important chemical that is called the renin. So renin is secreted by the granular cells located in the wall of the afferent artery. Make sense? Now when these cells secrete renin, when these cells secrete the renin, when the blood pressure drops. So this is the afferent arteriole. Inside the arteriole, when the pressure goes below that is the mean arterial pressure, you remember, map, mean arterial pressure inside the afferent arterial goes below 80 millimeter of mercury. That means hypotension or low blood pressure. That will cause the secretion of renin from the granular cells in the wall of the afferent artery. Very important, okay? That means this renin should help to in increase the blood pressure. Makes sense. Because when blood pressure drops, granular cells secrete renin. Now renin is the chemical that converts angiotensinogen, long word, to Another chemical that is called angiotensin 1. So renin converts the angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Okay? Then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 and this angiotensin 2 is an active chemical okay so angiotensin 2 you get angiotensin 2 from angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 1 comes from angiotensinogen. Who converts the angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1? Renin. Renin. Is it clear? Okay. Now, <coughs> this angiotensin 2 causes generalized vasoconstriction. Generalized means everywhere in your body, not lo not localized. I said what? Generalized everywhere. It does what? Vasoconstriction. You already remember that if blood vessel is constricted, <coughs> blood pressure goes up. Right? Vasodilation <coughs> lowers the blood pressure. Vasoconstriction does what? Increases the blood pressure. Make sense? So the blood pressure goes up increases the blood pressure. Okay? So that's how the renin helps to regulate the or increase the blood pressure. Okay? Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by an enzyme that is called uh, angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, converting enzyme that converts 1 to 2. So renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1 and converting enzyme converts here okay, to 2. So that is the mechanism how the blood pressure is regulated by renin. <coughs> okay. Angiotensin 2 has other actions too 
to increase the blood pressure. This is the main action, generalized vasoconstriction. But other actions are what? <coughs> Stimulates the reabsorption of sodium at the tube or nephron directly and also by releasing aldosterone. Now, if you go back to my last lecture, last week, I told you that aldosterone that comes from adrenal gland sitting on the kidney and works on distal convoluted tubule and reabsorbs sodium and water. So more water reabsorption means more water is going back to the body, blood volume will go up, blood pressure will go up. So this is another way how angiotensin 2 increases the blood pressure by releasing more aldosterone from the adrenal gland. Stimulates the hypothalamus. Uh, in ANP1, if you remember, I said that hypothalamus regulates food and water intake. One important function, interesting function. How much you will drink, that is controlled by hypothalamus, okay? So, angiotensin 2 stimulates the hypothalamus where you have the thirst center. So, you will feel what? Thirsty. Okay, make sense? So, you will drink more water. So if you drink more water, blood volume will go up, right? So that will also improve, increase the blood pressure, okay? So, and angiotensin 2 works on different uh, structures. On adrenal gland to release aldosterone, on the hypothalamus to stimulate the thirst center. So you feel more thirsty. Okay. <clears throat> Countercurrent mechanism. This is very important and interesting. Uh, you will understand now. Again, this is the nephron, proximal convoluted tubule. This is what? Everybody. Loop of Henley, right? And this is distal convoluted tubule collecting duct. Okay. So, this is loop of Henley. This is the two types of neurons, that's why not neurons, two types of nephrons you have in the kidneys. You remember in last class I said short looped and long looped. Okay? This is a long loop nephron that is called juxta medullary. Juxta medullary nephron. Short loop nephrons are called cortical nephrons. Let me draw here that one too. Short loop. Okay? So you have both short loop and long loop nephrons. This is called cortical, cortical nephron, and this long loop one is called what? Juxta medullary nephron. Make sense? In human kidney, eighty-five percent is cortical, and in last class I mentioned cortical nephrons produce what kind of urine? Concentrated or diluted? Diluted, yes. And long loop nephrons produce concentrated, remember, okay? And I told you, remember that camels, they have what kind of nephrons more? Juxta medullary because they need to preserve water. Anyway, so just reminding 15% is juxta medullary. Now, This is a juxta medullary long loop nephron. And efferent arterial glomerulus. I'm drawing the same thing again and again. Efferent arterial. And now you must remember a ladder shaped capillary is 
around the loop of Henley. What's the shape? Ladder. <coughs> so it has bars like this, and this is called Vasa recta. So this capillary which is around the loop of Henle, long loop of Henle, that is called Vasa recta. Okay? And this is the loop of Henle. Now everybody help me. The fluid, filtration occurs here, the fluid passes through the proximal convoluted tubule, then enters into the descending limb of the loop of Henle, right? And while the fluid is passing through the descending limb of loop of Henle, this allows what? This allows which chemical to get out? Only? Only what? Water. Remember that? This part only allows water reabsorption. Is it clear? So, water will get out. Only water. And will enter in the interstitial space here. So now you guys tell me, if water gets out, the concentration of fluid will increase or decrease? Increase. increase. Right? So as the fluid goes down, it goes up. Concentration goes up. Is it clear? Okay. Now, uh, what happens, continuously, fluid is passing through the loop of Henle because blood is continuously producing, uh, you know, being filtered and urine is being produced continuously. So now water is being reabsorbed here continuously. And what this capillary is doing, Vasa recta, taking the water immediately inside it, inside the blood. Make sense? If Vasa recta is not here, just think that if your capillary or Vasa recta is not here, then what would have happened? The pressure of water will go up here, right? No more water will be able to get out. So blood is doing what? The capillary is doing what? Quickly removing the water from there, taking the water from there, right? So new water is getting out. Make sense, right? If vas recta is not there, then water will accumulate, right? Edema will occur, right? So no new water will be able to get out. So that's why this is very important, having the vas recta here. So continuously water is getting out, entering here, and then from there taken into the blood. And blood is circulating, okay? <coughs> now, you tell me. When the fluid is going through the ascending limb of loop of Henle, few minutes ago I also showed you last week too. Which chemicals get out here? Sodium, potassium, very good, and chlorine. Remember that? No water, only the solids. And this blood is taking them inside removing them quickly. Make sense? So, the presence of vas recta is very important. If this one is not here, then potassium concentration, sodium concentration will be very high here. No new, you know, sodium potassium will be able to get out. That means no urine, useful urine will be produced. So, vas recta is continuously taking the water and other chemicals out from that area, taking them back to the body. Okay? <clears throat> now, uh, you tell me, when the fluid is going down this way, the concentration is going what? Up. Concentration is going up. But the volume? Going down. Make sense? So volume going down. And in the blood, it's opposite. Because water is getting in, right? Into the blood. So concentration is going down, right? 
and volume is going up. So, same thing here. Okay? As the fluid is going up, concentration is going down, but in the blood, concentration is going up. Okay? So, that's why it is called counter current mechanism. Opposite, counter. Okay? The flow or direction is in opposite way. And this is very important. Without vas recta, your information is not possible. So to produce concentrated urine uh, or normal urine, you need the counter current mechanism. This mechanism must work. Okay. Between the loop of Henle and the vas recta. Now, if you cut the kidney and this is how the nephrons are located inside the kidney. You see the pyramid, you must remember the pyramid. So this is just one nephron, you have like you know uh, many thousands. And one thing you remember here, I told you in first class that urine is secreted from the papilla, the tip of the pyramid here into the minor calyx. Why? Because you see, the end of collecting duct is here. That means this part is here. So the urine is secreted here. So you have many collecting duct ending here. So urine is secreted from here. Okay? Into the minor calyx. Make sense? So all the collecting ducts are ending there in the papilla of the pyramid. Make sense? So that's why the urine is getting into the minor calyx. And then, if you measure the fluid here, that means the all the way here, in the long loop of Henley, the concentration is very high, about 1200 to 1400 in last class I mentioned. Milli osmo highest okay and here is only 100 to 300 milli also okay that's what they have shown here okay concentration should be very high here and low there okay makes sense right okay urinary bladder Urinary bladder is located in the pelvic part or pelvic cavity here and it holds the urine for few to several hours. So holding the urine is the function of the bladder, okay? Which is very important I mentioned before because your kidneys are continuously producing urine, right? Because blood is continuously flowing. And if you didn't have the bladder, okay? Just think that urine continuously would get out from the body, right? That is not a comfortable situation. So you need something that will hold the urine for a few hours and when you deserve, you can expel it out, okay? So that's the function of the bladder. Now, if you see inside the bladder, this is the urinary bladder, this is the wall of the bladder. Urethra is this one. To take the urine out from the bladder to the outside of the body. Okay, so this is the urethra. And two more openings you see inside the bladder for the ureters. Right? So ureters bring the urine in and urethra takes the urine what? Out. Make sense? So how many ureter? Two from two kidneys, right? Enter into the bladder and one urethra that takes the urine out. So you will see three openings. Two ureteral openings and one urethral 
opening. Okay. <coughs> now, the area around the urethral opening, if you see the wall, it is very shiny, smooth. It's like, actually, this is, I, I am showing you the section. So it is like a funnel like this. And the wall is very smooth. The wall is very smooth. And it is like a funnel. And that helps to pour the urine into the narrow urethra here. And this part is called the trigon. Trigon. Okay? So around the urethral opening, you have a funnel shaped area where uh, the surface is very smooth, and that is the trigon here. <coughs> now, the rest part, if you see inside, you'll see many rugae. You remember gastric rugae holdings? Similarly, you'll see rugae. These are also called rugae. So, that you will see inside the rest part of the urethra. Okay? And the wall is a smooth muscle. This smooth muscle is a little bit different than other smooth muscles in the body. This one can has more elasticity, so it can expand and Required okay, more, but it is a smooth muscle. And innermost epithelial lining is transitional, so the fluid cannot get back into the body. Transitional epithelium has two properties one is it can stretch if the pressure increases, number two, it prevents the water get back into the body. So it doesn't allow the fluid or urine to get back into the body, which is very important. Just think that your bladder is holding the urine, right, for a few hours. So the lining of the bladder does not do what? Allow the urine pass through it. If the urine pass through the lining wall, then it will again go back to the body. We don't want that, right? Make sense? We want the urine stay there and get out from the body. That's why you have the transitional epithelial line. Two reasons. One is, urinary bladder gets big and small, right? So that epithelial, transitional epithelium can take that pressure. It can get stressed, okay? Stretched. And also prevent the urine get back into the body. Now, one more thing. This is your body cavity, okay? This is the body wall, like abdominal cavity. This is the abdominal cavity, okay? You remember the peritoneum that goes like this, right? Covers the internal organs, okay? And the peritoneum, the parietal peritoneum is attached to the wall, like this. And this one, goes like that. So this is the parietal peritoneum, okay? That uh, only covers the superior surface of the kidney. It doesn't go to the pelvic cavity. So it goes down like this, then covers the upper surface of the urinary bladder, not kidney, urinary bladder, then goes like this. So if I see the wall in this part, outermost layer is the peritoneum. So it's like this. Okay? That's what it says. Fibus adventitia. That's the peritoneum actually in the superior surface of the bladder only. Okay. Again, quickly reviewing. So this is the bladder. Two ureter enter. Bring the urine in. Here. They have shown the openings. And this is the urethra. 
urethral opening, and this part is the triangle, like this. Okay, so smooth surface, and this part has rough ridges. Those are called rugae. Okay, and uh, yeah, and this is the smooth muscle, the wall that can, you know, that has more elasticity. This is the peritoneum, covers the superior surface, or adventitia. Now, here, in the urethra, you have two sphincters, internal and external urethral sphincters, okay? And you see here, internal urethral sphincter and external urethral sphincter. Now, this is important to know that internal urethral sphincter is a smooth muscle, this muscle. And external comes from the body wall, that is the skeletal muscle. Okay? So this sphincter that keeps the opening constricted, that is the skeletal muscle, external sphincter, and internal here also constricted by the smooth muscle. Now which one is voluntary? external. Make sense? Skeletal is voluntary, you know that, right? So, what happens, you see, this is interesting, that when you, so let me draw the urethra here, uh, that's the urethra, okay, you have the external sphincter here, that's the external sphincter, and this is the internal sphincter, this is smooth muscle, this is skeletal, muscle. Now, when we decide that we will relax the sphincters to urinate, first we voluntarily open this one, open this one, because this is voluntary, right? We can open it voluntarily. And when we do that, voluntarily open the external sphincter, it sends signal to the spinal cord. And then spinal cord sends signal to the internal sphincter because we cannot control that. So that is the reflex that comes from the spinal cord to the internal sphincter and it opens that one. So we open the external, spinal cord opens the internal. Is it clear? So when both are open, <laughs> then the urine will easily you press the bladder right by the muscles and urine will get out from the very bottom. Make sense? So that's how the urination takes place. Okay? Did you get it? So two sphincters. What are those? Internal and external. Internal is by what kind of muscle? Smooth. External is by skeletal. Which one is voluntary? External, right? So when we decide to urinate, we relax the external, voluntarily, right? When external is relaxed, a signal goes to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord sends signal to the internal smooth muscle to relax, okay? And when both are open, then you use the muscles, right? Abdominal pelvic muscles to press the bladder, and that will Push the urine now. Okay. <clears throat> you know, when we get older, the muscles get weak, right? So your control, voluntary control on the muscle gets weaker, right? So sometimes that happens, the external sphincter, you know, uh, is not constricted enough. That can cause the problem if you lose the motor control on the muscles. Anyway. <clears throat> Uh, female urethra that I mentioned in first uh, lecture that uh, is much shorter than male. Female urethra is three to four uh, centimeter long, and male urethra is fifteen to twenty centimeter long. Okay, male urethra uh, has three parts: prostatic part, 
membranous part and spongy part. So prostate part is inside the prostate. You see here. <coughs> this is the medulla. This is the prostate under the bladder. So first part of urethra passes through the prostate, and that is the prostatic urethra. And then the membranous urethra is only this short part here, surrounded by the urogenital diaphragm. This is another diaphragm in your body. When you say diaphragm, you think this one, right? Here, that helps you breathing, diaphragm. But there is another diaphragm here. That one is smaller. Same thing like muscle, flat muscle, okay? So that is called urogenital diaphragm around the urethra. So this part of urethra, which is surrounded by the urogenital diaphragm, that is the membranous urethra, okay? And in the urogenital diaphragm, you have those tiny glands that secrete uh, mucus to keep the urethra slippery, warm, slippery. And 